Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a first of its kind criminal investigation in Canada. I spent Christmas with one less person to hug. Her father died of COVID-19. Now the RCMP is looking at his workplace. You look at me, like, look in my eyes. I'm telling you, it's serious. And you don't want to get it. Words of warning from COVID survivors as Ontario adds restrictions. An NHL season without a bubble, why the league says it's ready. And the push for vaccine independence. Canada has come to the understanding of that it needs to be a player. Where it's happening, how soon it's coming. This is The National. Well, for all those Canadians working through this pandemic who can't do their jobs from home, putting food on the table can mean putting themselves in daily danger. Now, a CBC News investigation is raising questions about whether the occupational health and safety system is properly protecting essential workers. At least 33 workers have died in Canada after contracting COVID-19 on the job. That is according to claims submitted to and accepted by workers' compensation boards across the country. But now, as Dave Seglins tells us, the RCMP is investigating one of those deaths. A man who worked at the Cargill Meat Processing Plant in High River, Alberta, where more than 900 people got sick. We live the same day every single day, knowing what happened and the people that did it are living their lives. I spent Christmas with one less person to hug. <laughs> 16-year-old Ariana Casada and her mother came to this RCMP detachment in High River to press them to investigate her father's death. Benito was 51 and supporting his family by working at Cargill's meat processing plant, it was deemed essential and kept running as the pandemic spread across Canada. Hundreds of workers became infected, including Benito, who died only weeks later. The family alleges Cargill didn't do enough to protect its workers by supplying proper masks or ensuring distancing. Cargill, even though it's worth millions and billions of dollars, it's not exempt from the law. Cargill says it's not seen the criminal complaint, so can't respond directly, but wrote, the safety of our employees is our top priority and that Cargill has operated in a manner that meets or exceeds the federal government's health and safety standards. The RCMP confirms to CBC News it has now opened an investigation, believed to be the first criminal probe in Canada into a COVID death tied to someone's work. Usually, police defer to provincial labour officials. But that's part of the problem, say some experts, who say the system in the early days of COVID collapsed with inspectors unable to properly get inside to monitor workplace health and safety. I think the COVID pandemic lays bare and is going to continue to lay bare the fact that many workplaces are dangerous, that there are risks taken with workers' lives, that the regulatory system that we have in place is insufficient to deal with these risks. Leaving Ariana and her family hoping that police can deliver some form of accountability. There's not a moment that goes by that we don't think of him, and I want all the people at Cargill, especially the authority figures, every day when they go to work, to think of him every single day, because every single day I have to live with the fact that I don't have a dad anymore. CBC News has found three other cases where complaints were filed with police. In Ontario, three frontline healthcare workers who got COVID on the job and died, their union accusing the employers of criminal negligence. Police did not step in in those cases. And instead, they deferred to provincial labour inspectors, whose penalties would be far less severe. Those investigations remain ongoing. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. OK, now let's bring in infectious disease specialist Dr. Suman Chakrabarti, because uh, Dr. Chakrabarti, I think the Cargill case raises all kinds of important questions in a broader sense, right, when it comes to where this virus spreads. So what does it suggest to you about, I don't know, wh where we ought to be focusing our attention? 
Yeah, it's a really good point. I think that we have an appropriate focus on what's happening in the community, you know, what we can do in our households, things we can do to, to keep safe. But I think one area that requires a lot more focus is what's happening in uh, many uh, essential services, such as factories, food processing plants. We're seeing infections happen there, but the big thing is, is these infections can then be brought home. And statistically, many people who work in these industries have large households. And you can see a very significant amplification of the infections when in that situation. And that can really be a driver of what's happening. So, you know, this is a thing also that's very important to note that the lockdown is not going to affect this. And you have to look at it more specifically with different types of interventions to help uh, bring the cases down in that sector. So, so very quickly, what would you expect provinces to do with that knowledge and that awareness? I mean, what, what could they do? A couple of things, keep the workplaces safe, mask, physical distancing, paid sick leave so people aren't afraid to come forward because if they have to go off work, they won't lose wages and they can still pay for essentials. And an isolation center, places where people can go to isolate away from their family and that helps to break the chains of transmission. There are other things as well, but these things are, are much more effective than a lockdown for this sector. I think it's important to consider and I hope the government does in the next uh, couple of days to weeks. Dr. Chakrabarty, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Workplaces are also a driver of infections in Ontario, where new projections to be released tomorrow show this pandemic is taking a turn for the worse. Ontario added more than 3,300 new COVID cases today, but that could seem small by the end of the month. Sources tell CBC News the province's own modelling shows as many as 6,000 new cases a day by then. Ellen Morrow with what new measures could be on the way to try to stop that. A snapshot of life before COVID for Ottawa mother Brianne Quarrel. I've had some really rough days with it because I was that close to dying. Quarrel spent two weeks on a ventilator in the spring. COVID caused her hair to fall out. Ten months later, symptoms linger and frustration mounts. I almost lost my life, but you think it's okay to get together for Christmas? You know, like really, are we going to be that selfish? Tomorrow, Ontario will reveal new modeling showing just how dire the pandemic is. CBC News has learned there could be 6,000 cases a day by month's end, with ICUs overrun by early February. We are looking at a, a, a lot of unnecessary death and human suffering here, not only from patients dying uh, a terrible death with COVID-19, but patients being unable to access uh, other life-saving services. Tougher measures are coming. There won't be a curfew, but sources say possibilities include another emergency declaration, shorter hours for essential businesses like grocery stores, and limits on construction activity. We are in a serious situation and serious measures need to be done. But the only way to quell the crisis, say many doctors and other public health officials, is ensuring paid sick leave for workers and increasing testing at large workplaces workplaces where people are getting COVID-19 and bringing it into their own homes and they're given poor incentives in terms of you know necessarily getting tested, isolation, financial instability. Tomorrow's modeling will also show many Ontarians are flouting public health guidelines with a spike in travel in the days before Christmas. What we're doing right now isn't working um, and I think it's really tragic. 31-year-old Amara Posian contracted COVID in May. Some days are still a struggle, she says, with brain fog and fatigue. You don't want to get it, and you don't want to pass it on. So the number of people hospitalized, Ellen, this is always a concern. What's Ontario's situation right now? Well, right now, Adrian, there are 387 COVID patients in ICUs across the province. 268 of them are on ventilators. And the president of the Ontario Hospital Association, who you heard from in the story, said that if things continue as they are, it is not outlandish to think that Ontario could find itself in the same position as New York or Italy in the first wave of the pandemic. Another sign of just how difficult, how sad this all is, Adrian, is that today Ontario passed the terrible milestone of more than 5,000 lives lost to COVID-19. A long road ahead. Ellen, thank you. Now, Quebec has had an 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew for three nights now, and today the Premier thanked his province for obeying it. I was very impressed to see the solidarity of Quebecers who massively respected the curfew 
Quebec recorded more than 1,800 new COVID cases today and added another 51 deaths. The goal of the curfew, of course, is to bring those numbers down. But as Alison Northcott explains, the pandemic hits some people harder than others. The empty streets of Montreal after curfew. Grocery stores like this one have to close by 7.30. Here, some staff hours have been cut, and those working late stocking shelves need a letter to show police in case they're stopped. One of our employees got uh, stopped three times on his way home, and uh, he doesn't live too far from here, so... I can understand it could be frustrating for the employees. Since the curfew came into effect, police have handed out 740 tickets to those breaking it. But the Premier says most people are complying, which is crucial as hospitalizations continue to rise. The situation is critical, especially in the Montreal region. The curfew also applies to the homeless population. Montreal police say they're urging people into shelters, ticketing as a last resort, and have issued one ticket to someone who identified as homeless who they say wouldn't cooperate. Advocates say Montreal shelters are already pushed to the brink and are calling on all levels of government to find more warm spaces quickly. What if they're in a crisis? They have no one to go to. Like the streets are emptied and that doesn't say that society cares much about you. On this third night under curfew, this Montreal street, which in normal times is quite busy, is very quiet this evening. We're able to be out with our camera because we're working, but that's one of a limited number of exceptions. Medical care is another, but even with a letter to show authorities, Hector Barrera worries about being stopped by police as he buses home from dialysis appointments. Just to be stopped, you know. Sometimes I don't even feel like talking after treatment. I'm very tired and uh, I don't really want to be bothered. I just want to go home. The province did reopen elementary schools today, taking what it calls a calculated risk, hoping the measures in place will be enough. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In Saskatchewan, eight more people have died from COVID-19, while COVID-related hospitalizations have hit an all-time high. The province reported 412 new cases today, but it's those in hospital who have officials really worried. 197 people have now been admitted, 31 in intensive care. Provincial restrictions are expected to be extended this week. Sadly, this weekend, we've had 22 more people who have died in our province from COVID-19. British Columbia has now seen more than 1,000 COVID-related deaths. Morgues in the province have had to bring in refrigerated trucks for the first time. Though Dr. Bonnie Henry says new cases and hospitalizations are starting to plateau. Very shortly, our capacity to administer these vaccines will outstrip the projected supply. And that is Jason Kenney warning Ottawa that Alberta could soon run out of vaccines as the province moves to expand its vaccination program. All paramedics and emergency medical responders will now be included in phase one of the rollout. Well, the NHL is two days away from hitting the ice for a new season. And despite COVID, it won't be in a bubble. As Jamie Strachan tells us, the league says it's ready for anything. And the Tampa Bay Lightning are 2020 Stanley Cup champions. Three months after the Stanley Cup was won, the players are back again for a new and shorter 56-game season. We have to be ready to adjust and adapt to anything that may happen. Unlike last season, the NHL will not play its games in a bubble. Like the NBA and NFL, it will allow teams to play in their home arenas, most of them empty. Only about a half dozen U.S.-based teams will allow limited fans. Canada's NHL teams will compete in a this-season-only Canadian division and will only play in this country. The league says it will strictly enforce dozens of safety protocols. The purpose of having the protocols isn't so that we can punish people. The purpose of the protocols is to keep everybody as safe and healthy as possible. And, um, One of the league's superstars knows the players are under public scrutiny, even before, more than usual. You know, we're definitely not, uh, you know, not lost on, on where the world's at and where our country's at. But McDavid hopes the league's return will brighten a bleak winter. There's lots of people stuck at home needing something to watch, needing something to follow, um, needing some type of normalcy. So hopefully seeing us out on the ice can, can bring that back to them. 
two days before puck drop and there are challenges already. The NHL is dealing with an outbreak in Dallas, for example, affecting multiple players and staff. We're still trying to uh, get our arms around exactly uh, how the spread occurred. Um, it has uh, turned out to be kind of a classic outbreak. Bettman says that by pushing forward during a pandemic, the league is actually losing money, but says a lost season would be devastating for fans and the game. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the president and CEO of the largest hospital ne network in southwestern Ontario has been fired. Dr. Paul Woods was let go by the London Health Sciences Centre for travelling five times to the U.S. during the pandemic. In a statement, the hospital's board said the situation had affected the confidence of staff and the community in his leadership. CBC News has learned the former CEO of Niagara Health and St. Joseph's Health System will be eligible for more than a million dollars in severance pay. Dr. Tom Stewart was fired as head of both hospitals last week after he vacationed in the Dominican Republic over the holidays. And we do have some breaking news tonight from Ottawa. CBC News has also learned that a federal cabinet shuffle is coming Tuesday morning. Navdeep Bains, Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, has decided not to run in the next election and is leaving cabinet. Current Foreign Affairs Minister François-Philippe Champagne will replace him with Transport Minister Marc Garneau moving to Foreign Affairs. Sources say Omar Al-Gabra will be promoted to cabinet to take over at Transport. Well, at least for now, this is still the domain of Donald Trump. House Democrats pushed impeachment plans forward today. That debate is set for Wednesday. Susan Ormiston spoke with an expert who says the Democrats may be using the wrong strategy to bring Trump down. But she begins our Washington coverage with the hunt for insurrectionists and growing fears over new violence. The FBI want this guy who brandished the Confederate flag, a toxic symbol of slavery. Tips on the rioters are pouring in 40,000 as anger grows. And in a stunning accusation, the former head of the Capitol Police said he begged the Pentagon to send in the National Guard at 2.30 last Wednesday, but was told the optics didn't look good. The Guard finally mobilized three hours later. Security is being winched tighter now in the U.S. Capitol, with D.C.'s mayor asking people to stay home next week. To protect the District of Columbia from a repeat of the violent insurrection. The FBI warns of armed protests, refuse to be silenced on Capitol Hill and 50 other state capitals beginning later this week. Also threats against Nancy Pelosi, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. I'm not afraid of taking you with that side. Fears, too, of a COVID super spreader. Wednesday, members of Congress trapped in the gallery were herded to a safe room where a group of six Republicans refused to put on masks. One congresswoman in that room, a cancer survivor, has now contracted COVID. All this as Donald Trump enters his last full week as president, staring down another impeachment vote on Wednesday. Getting articles of impeachment passed by the House as soon as possible gives us our best insurance policy in case Donald Trump does something else really bad before Inauguration Day. But proving Trump was trying to overthrow his own government will be hard. Trying to impeach him on seditious conspiracy would be easier, says Cunningham. I think what they need to prove is there was a conspiracy to uh, attack the Capitol for the purpose of halting the election um, and that uh, he was part of that. I, that I think they can prove. Tried to prove it was an insurrection, I think, uh, is not necessary and it's difficult. Silenced on social media, Trump has not appeared at all to speak to Americans, although he is expected to go visit the wall tomorrow in Texas, Adrian. And so, Susan, another uh, cabinet resignation for Trump today. Yeah, an important one. The acting head of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, abruptly quit tonight. He called the riots up here last week sickening and tragic. So nine days out from inauguration, we have that security plan being moved up a week, putting lockdowns into D.C. this week in order to protect the U.S. Capitol. Adrian, it's hard to imagine even the worst doomsayers would have predicted Trump's presidency to unravel like this. Yeah, no kidding. All right, Susan Ormerson in Washington. Thanks, Susan. 
Well, the social media company known as Parler was pulled off the internet overnight by tech giant Amazon. It's because Parler was used to help plan last week's attack on the Capitol. But Aaron Collins explores whether Amazon's response here might only lead to more problems. Almost a week old, these images still stun. The U.S. Capitol under siege at the behest of its president. Much of this fury fueled online. So we need to think about very serious repercussions for anyone, anyone who uses a platform for hate speech, because that is not free speech. Well, those repercussions came quickly for Donald Trump, punted from Facebook and Twitter for inciting violence, the president embracing the mob in one of his last tweets. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. The social media app Parler, a rival to Twitter used by the alt-right, was shut down. Its hosting services yanked by Amazon, a move that some worry gives large corporations too much control over public discourse. Uh, we may rue the day in some circumstances where we're happy in some, some instances, but there may well be others where we say this leaves us really concerned that what we thought was pretty legitimate speech, even if at the edge, uh, may get removed. Parler is thought to have been used by many who stormed the Capitol, and experts say it could be back online this week. Well, if it isn't, the worry is that the extreme right will find a new place to voice their views, one that's harder to keep tabs on. I predict quite a bit of migration into some of these smaller platforms, and I think it's something we have to watch very closely. For one thing, I think the world really does need alternatives to Facebook and Twitter, I really don't love the idea that these alternatives are going to be built by the Nazis. Still, many of the people in this mob remain on Facebook and Twitter too. The big players still dominate social media. Their challenge, making sure extreme or violent ideas talked about on their platforms don't spill out into the real world. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. With more lockdowns, more Canadians are changing how they get their groceries. We're seeing growth rates today that we expected to see three to four years from now. Next on The National, a big pivot for Canadian grocery stores, but what happens after the pandemic? We'll take you inside the race for a Made in Canada COVID vaccine. I think to be self-sufficient is important. And the return of sex in the city. You were excited by the fashion. You were excited by the life in New York City. Rebooting an episode of pop culture history. We are back in two. Welcome back. As lockdowns and curfews keep more people at home, grocery stores have been forced to invest in and adapt to a high volume of online orders. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, they are hoping that trend will last even when we're in the clear of coronavirus. Grocery delivery has gone from novel to normal. We're seeing growth rates today that we expected to see three to four years from now. When the pandemic first hit, Sobe says online orders increased 300%. As the lockdown announcements continue, more and more people turn to online grocery. Expansion plans already in the works have become an even bigger priority. Like this $100 million warehouse Sobeys opened in June. Hundreds of robots on a grid three stories high bring groceries to the human packers below. They can pick a 50 item order in five minutes. Over the past year, grocers raced to keep up with demand. Loblaw opened more pickup locations and converted sections of five existing stores to strictly process orders, including one automated location in Toronto with more in the works. Metro also increased order capacity out of its hub stores and plans to open its first online fulfillment center in Montreal this summer. We believe that post-COVID uh, consumer behavior will have uh, shifted somewhat towards online uh, purchases. Online groceries had been a tough sell in the past and still not all Canadians are biting. I haven't tried it yet. I always assumed that it was more expensive. I like to choose my own. I think that tactile uh, experience is really important um, to Canadians. This industry analyst says many new online shoppers will likely return to stores. I suspect there may be some disappointment in how much 
um, online, continued online grocery shopping there's going to be. Sophie says it doesn't expect e-commerce to take over entirely. The majority of sales are going to continue to be in store for a very long time. Still, consumers and grocers have had a taste of the future that may have taken years otherwise. Hi there. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next, the race for a made in Canada COVID vaccine. I think to be self-sufficient is important, especially uh, in these times where the whole population is at risk. Why Canada's long-term vaccine plan is crucial now and maybe more so in the future. And later, a moment of joy for a family from Nigeria, their first Canadian winter. But first... One, two... Boom, 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 boom. So this is the return of the sun fireworks. We're on the ice road in Inuvik. This is how you say welcome back to the sun in Inuvik Northwest Territories. Fireworks are just one part of the Sunrise Festival changed by the pandemic this year, not canceled. People there celebrate the sun peeking back up over the horizon after nearly a month of darkness. A welcome sight any year, but perhaps especially this one. Vaccines are important and I care about vaccines. I want us to have that great British summer. Well, the UK's vaccination plan kicked into high gear today. Since Thursday, when authorities there approved the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, daily shots went up to an average of 210,000. The target, 2 million per week. That's just one benefit of making a vaccine within your own borders. Now, Canada used to have that kind of capacity, but decades ago, it sold it off. Now, governments are quickly spending large amounts of money to get it back and not just to tackle this pandemic. Joanna Romiliotis shows us why it's so critical. Far from the vaccine headlines, not far from Quebec City, the construction of Canada's long game. If all goes according to plan, this is where a homemade vaccine for COVID-19 will be made from start to finish. I think it's a part of the role of uh, the Canadian public health to be able to develop strategies to, uh, to protect uh, Canadians. Medicago, a biopharmaceutical company specializing in plant-based technology, is leading the race for a Canadian-made vaccine. And even though approved vaccines are already going into people's arms, the urgency here to keep moving forward faster hasn't let up. Because this is about immunity on a whole other level. Natalie Charlon is the senior director of scientific and medical affairs at Medicago. So to secure the production of vaccine within our own borders, I think is important. So we've been working on this technology to address emerging threats for many, many years. So we, we are ready to go. Ready to go now and in the future. When the first batches of vaccine landed in Canada, Ottawa had already earmarked more than a billion dollars to keep getting more. But it has also been investing hundreds of millions of dollars in vaccine research and manufacturing here, investing too in the promise of vaccine independence. With this COVID-19 crisis, Canada has come to the understanding of that it needs to be a player. Uh, Scott Halperin is the director of the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology in Halifax. Canada's strategy, he says, is about doing what it can to protect people now while going back to the future. We used to have capacity. We lost capacity. You know, Canada was at the lead of vaccine manufacturing back in the 50s and 60s with the Connaught Laboratories and there were uh, production facilities uh, in Quebec as well. We lost that um, as as globalization occurred and companies moved their facilities to cheaper places to make vaccines, uh, we didn't step in and say we need to do something to maintain facilities here. And I think we're learning that that was probably not a good idea and uh, need to reverse that trend. Toronto's Connaught Medical Research Laboratories shared headline news across Canada this week. When that historical trend has already had an impact. Back then, the Connaught Laboratories at the University of Toronto played a key role in developing and improving immunizations for rabies, smallpox and polio. And the vaccinated blood, thus trained to deal with the real polio virus, makes the person immune. When the labs were sold, Canada's public manufacturing capacity was gutted. And when the pandemic broke, promising research here was stalled. 
within five weeks we had our vaccine made in the lab and ready to go into the animal testing. We were right on track there. And, uh... Last spring, the vaccine and infectious disease organization was a front runner. Now it's catching up. The public health lab at the University of Saskatchewan was the first in Canada to successfully isolate the COVID-19 virus and its vaccine candidate was one of the first in the world to prove 90% efficacy in animal studies. But delays in obtaining vaccine-grade components from suppliers to keep the research going slowed the momentum. The research here that we're doing is, is really cutting edge and at the forefront of vaccine research in general. Dr. Volker Gertz leads the team at Vito. I think where we're lacking behind is then taking that research and, and getting it into product. I think that's the recognized lack that we have at the moment, and that's why we're seeing investments right now in building our capacity to do that. Tens of millions of dollars of government funding is going towards Vito's vaccine development and manufacturing. Its facility is being upgraded to produce human-grade vaccines. It should be ready by the end of this year, and once it's up and running, we'll manufacture up to 40 million doses of vaccine a year. It is important for Canadians to have long-term access to vaccines that are made here, made for Canadians. And might find ourselves in the future again in a position where we're lacking behind and maybe then we're more unlucky and not getting access to these vaccines. So I think in the long term it's very important for Canada to have sufficient vaccine development and manufacturing capacity in the country so that we don't rely and depend on other countries in the future. But the immediate future is also uncertain. There's not enough vaccine for everyone yet. The spiraling toll on lives, the burden on exhausted health care systems continues. So does the crushing economic and mental fatigue. And while more vaccine is expected, there could be production glitches, delays in delivery. All that demands a Canadian backup. I think to be self-sufficient is important, especially in these times where the whole population is at risk. And self-sufficiency isn't far away. Medicago's clinical trials are moving along, and if they go well, a made-in-Canada vaccine will be available by the end of this year. When the facility in Quebec is ready in 2023, that means all of Medicago's vaccines will be produced here too. Even with coronavirus, we don't know if it's going to go away after, after this pandemic. It might become what we call endemic, a bit like influenza might come back every year. So we might need to develop vaccines for new, uh, new strains circulating. That will help Canada defeat COVID-19 and prepare for other emerging viruses. Viruses that may not become global pandemics, but can cause deadly disease. So we want to be able to have multiple irons in the fire. Halperin says Canada needs to be able to protect its own population and also has a moral responsibility to the developing world. It's important considering that we need billions of doses worldwide, even if we don't need it for our own purposes, having that capacity to help supply the world's needs should be an important priority for Canada as well. It's why he says Canada must continue investing, must commit to the long haul. What's at stake if they don't? We're back to where we were for the next time it comes around. A mad rush and, and having to depend on the early ones from biotech companies that were nurtured elsewhere. Security, independence, that is the end game. And the pandemic has already proven time is on no one's side. So, Joanna, you mentioned thinking ahead beyond this pandemic. What's the specific warning there? Well, every expert we spoke to, Andrew, said the big takeaway from this pandemic is that Canada needs to become self-reliant in vaccine supply and ready to respond quickly to the next viral threat. And it is a matter of when, not if. On average, a new emerging virus comes out every, shows up rather, every couple of years. More often, if you consider the diseases that infect livestock first, then get passed on to human. And while they, they don't all, fortunately, become global pandemics of this scale, they do cause severe disease. And think about but SARS, H1N1, MERS, Zika, those all happened in the last few years and underscore why Canada needs to be so self-reliant when it comes to vaccines. And, and the World Health Organization has said all along that poor countries will need help to vaccinate. What's the case for Canada to be part of that? 
Well, if Canada wants to be a world player on the stage, it does have to contribute to the global vaccine supply, and there's a need for it. And it all hinges on us returning to some kind of normal. It hinges on the world returning to normal, and that's going to require max, mass vaccinations and will require billions upon billions of doses. Ioana Romeliotis, thank you very much. Next, an ICU nurse finally gets her COVID vaccine. I was so excited. It's just that snippet of hope in a very, very long year. Her personal journey from fear to anger to relief right after the break and later. Hello, lover. The risks and rewards of rebooting a hit TV show from the past. Across the country, healthcare workers have been going flat out for almost a year now, leaving many doctors and nurses struggling to take care of their own health along with their patients. Bonnie Allen has one nurse's very difficult personal story, capped now with some newfound hope. <laughs> it's moments like this that help soothe Andrea Kozlowski. The 29-year-old registered nurse has a stressful job caring for COVID-19 patients in a Saskatoon ICU, where she has had many moments that haunt her, like one she shared with us when we first met last month. The patient couldn't breathe. It was like one word at a time. And like we're, we're watching their oxygen numbers go down and down and down and we're waiting to intubate and the patient said, no, I need to talk to every family member before you intubate me because I need to say goodbye. And you could hear the family crying on the phone through glass doors. The strain extends beyond the ICU. There's constant fear of exposure to the virus and potentially taking it home to her family. You like run to the shower, try to scrub off anything that's on you because your biggest fear when you get home is having something on you and giving it to your family. As the pandemic wore on, Kozlowski noticed she had changed. I was getting very angry, um, enraged over the smallest things, like breaking things, enraged. And then? And just sad and uncontrollably crying and then there would come the panic attacks. Kozlowski uses exercise as a release but it hasn't been enough so by fall she started taking antidepressant medication. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only healthcare worker that this happened to. And now more relief. I like ran in and they she was recently they vaccinated against COVID-19. Was so excited. It's just that snippet of hope in a very, very long year. She says it's not a magic wand that fixes everything. The workload and precautions haven't changed, but getting the shot does ease one worry. At least I'll be healthy to be able to take care of the people that aren't. Because despite all the stress, this ICU nurse still loves her job and helping to save lives. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, to date, more than 17,000 Canadians have died after contracting COVID-19. We've been bringing you some of their stories as told by their loved ones. And tonight, a son remembers his mother who died in November. My name is Jim Friesen, and I lost my mother, Elizabeth Reimer Friesen, to COVID-19 on November 23rd at the age of 99 years and eight months. Mum was born near Cleefeld, Manitoba on March 19th, 1921, and passed away in the Rest Haven Nursing Home in Steinbeck, Manitoba. Mum was born third of 10 children into a farming family where faith and service to others were high values. After some years of grade school, Mum completed a correspondence course in nursing. In 1945, at the age of 24, Mum was asked to become the matron of the Rest Haven Nursing Home, the very nursing home in which she died last month. After Dad's wife, Annie, passed away, he was left with seven young children between the ages of two and 16. My father began to visit Elizabeth in Winkler and he asked her to leave her career to which she had devoted her life in order to marry him and take care of his family. 
Mom and Dad had my sister Louise and me, and that completed their family of nine children. Mom was resourceful in so many ways. I have a favorite memory of Mom's baking innovations, which I learned when I was trying to make Mom's special brown bread. Mom might improvise by using cookie crumbs instead of the full amount of sugar. Mom was compassionate, intelligent, highly respected career woman in a culture that frowned on women in the workplace. She loved to care for the elderly, and we heard many stories of her experiences as a nurse. This important work is our mother's legacy. My sister Louise, mom's firstborn, remarked how ironic it was that mom was receiving nursing care in that same home that mom helped to establish all those years ago. Mom remarked in low German, Eine Matzik fehl je volle Lota. Roughly translated, this means that one must resign oneself to things outside of one's control and find peace with life. Mom knew what was important to her and held on with faith, courage, and composure. Elizabeth Friesen was just one of so many in Canada now lost to COVID-19. We have been sharing their stories through our interactive website. You can have a look at cbc.ca slash remembered. Yet another TV series from the 90s is getting a reboot. This time it's Sex in the City. Now, such projects can bomb or they can find new success. Briar Stewart looks at the particular challenges facing this show's storyline. And just like that. That was the confirmation that the women of Sex in the City will be back for another round. Sort of. Well, the series revolved around the love and laughs of four friends, Kim Cattrall, a.k.a. Samantha Jones, is opting out of the reboot. Dirty martini, dirty bastard. Known for being fierce and funny, she will be glaringly absent. I'm wondering, do fans really want to see it without Samantha? Still, many are intrigued. I'm hoping to just see a progression of the characters, a progression of women in their 50s. And now. Rebecca Bolwit got hooked on the series more than two decades ago. I was a young woman in her early 20s in a new city and watching this program about life, love, friendship and uh, relationships. And so that's what appealed to me. Hello, lover. The women were known for strutting around Manhattan in designer shoes and gossiping about their escapades over cocktails. It didn't matter what age you were, you were excited by the fashion, you were excited by, you know, the life in New York City. The show wrapped after nearly 100 episodes. There were also two movies. The second one was widely panned, which is why some are baffled there's a reboot. They are running the very real risk of hurting the goodwill that people have towards Sex and the City, which is a show that does hold up in a lot of ways and doesn't in a lot of ways. And fans say one of the ways it doesn't is that it really only depicts a white upper-class version of New York City. As a black woman who loves sex and loves sex in the city, I have to roll my eyes and I cringe a bit re-watching that show. Which is why some who will tune into the next chapter may do so out of curiosity to see just how the women and the plot lines change with the times. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, next on The National, a Nigerian family experiences a Canadian winter. Their joy from seeing snow for the first time and starting a fresh chapter in life. It's next in our moment. Well, as you can see here, the Oyedele family might be enjoying the snow more than many Canadians this winter because it's their first Canadian winter. Now, long before the pandemic, they had been working to get to Canada from Nigeria. And now they're here, arriving at a pretty interesting time. Tonight, there are moments. It's been a wonderful experience. Really, we, we had looked forward to it for a couple of months before it eventually worked out. We've never been to this part of the world and um, we just um, try to relate, we try to find a community. I can remember when we landed here, my girl Glory said, Mommy, I hope we are not going anywhere else. I said, yes, we are, <laughs> we are here now. <laughs> 
the weather was awesome. <laughs> you know, this is the first snow we are experiencing like this, and we really need to, we had to pray, like, God help us. When I lived in Nigeria, I thought snow didn't exist anymore. I've never built a snowman, but I've had fun in the snow. Even it made us feel like Much home, easier. like uh, we are already home, you know. We're, we're so grateful for the whole experience, it's been wonderful. Oh, I love that. That's great. So, a couple things that snow is fantastic, I have to say, it looks fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And whatever joy that you have, if you could bottle that and hang, hang on to it. <laughs> Yeah. because it's possible that the novelty will wear off. Yeah, uh, although, I mean, you know what the progression is, right? I mean, they've done snowmen, yep. snow angels, maybe some snowshoeing, ice skating. Next Maple thing, syrup. Well, and and then snow. next thing you know, they'll be just snowboarding down the half pipe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It'll be great. That's the National for this January 11th. Welcome and good night. Good night.